Well, good morning once again. Let me. Boy, God bless us with such a beautiful day today, man. Yes. Compared to back east where they're having blizzards and <laughs> pray for those people. I, I thank the Lord every day that I don't live back there. No. <laughs> anyway, as you know, we are covering the the book of Hebrews, and uh, today we're going to be covering chapter seven. But before we get into chapter seven, what I would like to do, uh, go back to chapter one, and Pastor Rudy discussed chapter one with us, but there's some verses in chapter one that I want to tie it in to chapter seven. So if you would stand with me and we read the first few verses of uh, God's word, Hebrews chapter one, verses one through four. This is in the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom all, whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. That is God's word. You may be seated. Let me uh, open with prayer. God, our Heavenly Father, help me come before you, Father. And we put a request that the Holy Spirit now will open our hearts and minds to the message today. As we get into the superiority of Jesus, that there's no name in heaven greater than his name, Father. So, Father, please help us to, to use this information in a way that will strengthen our relationship with you. And that we can keep this information in mind, that we have responsibility to share it with others, to tell others about the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, who out of love for us came and died for our sins, Father. So we lift this prayer up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We know what I read there, really, it, it sets the, the tone for Hebrews chapter 7. It's about the superiority of Jesus. And, and Pastor Rudy, when you covered that, chapter 1, those first four ver verses, it was showing the superiority of Jesus over not only the angels, but of, of all of God's creation, because he's, he created everything, and he's in charge of everything. See, a lot of people have a problem with the superiority of Jesus. They don't have a problem with the word superiority, because the word superiority means one that's higher in rank, one that's higher in position, one that's higher in authority from someone else. It also means one of, of a greater nature. See, so most people don't have a problem with the word superiority, see, until you associate it with Jesus Christ. Then they have a problem with that. Because if they accept the fact that Jesus is superior, or he has a superior nature, and, and saying he has a superior nature also means that he has certain inherited characteristics or quality qualities about him that are superior to ours. And be more specifically would be that his divinity, the fact that he's perfect, that he's God. So a lot of people have a problem with that when they say the superior to Jesus. Now for them to accept that fact that he is superior means that one day they're going to have to stand before him. See, and they know that. They're going to have to stand before her and answer to why they led the life that they led. They have to answer to that, see. And so they, they, they can't sit here and agree with you that Jesus is superior, that he's divine, that he's the son of God, because they have to come before him one day and be accountable for the way that they led their lives. So there's no way they, that they want to agree with that statement, the superior, superiority of Jesus. And then there's other people who want to live a guilt-free life. They want to do whatever they want in life without any guilt, so they don't have any choice also that they don't want to agree with, oh, Jesus is divine, he's superior, he was perfect, he's the son of God. So there again, they don't want to agree on any of that because they want to live a guilt-free life. They want to live a, guy, a life without any consequences. But there, there is no such thing. Everything we do in life, there's consequences. Yeah. 
So many people have a problem with that, the superiority of Jesus. And then there are other people who have a problem with it because they say, well, if I accept the fact that Jesus is superior, if I accept the fact that he has a, that he has a, 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 a divine nature, that he's perfect, that he's, that he's God in the flesh, if I accept that, then that's to say then that's really only one way to heaven, or there's really on, only one way to God. And they vehemently are opposed to that. Because they wouldn't believe there are many ways to God, there are many paths to God. Some people say all paths lead to God. And this is what they want to believe. But these same people that want to believe that there are many paths to God, I guarantee you the life they're leading is going to be one of those paths. Because they don't want to change it, see? So they say many paths lead to God. So now what I do when I run across a person like that, I say just to be fictitious or, or I say sarcastic or just to humor them, sometimes I'll say, you know, you're exactly right. All paths lead to God. But here's the reason why. For judgment purposes. So the white throne judgment mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 because you're going to be judged for every single thing that you do. And this is why Jesus said what he did in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. He said, enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. And verse 14 of Matthew, added that in the last minute here, but 7 verse 14 also says, But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now look at that. It says, For wide is the gate, to the big wide gate. And it says, broad is the road that leads to destruction. And when I read that, you know what it reminds me of? The 60 freeway during rush hour. The 91 freeway during rush hour. That's what it reminds me of. I picture in my mind this broad road just jammed with people going off to destruction. See, that's what comes to my mind. And it's a shame. This wide gate to all these people. So I picture five, six, eight lanes, people just going off to destruction. And why? Because they don't want to accept the superiority of Jesus. They don't want to accept the divinity, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. They don't want to accept that. They rather do their own thing. But see right here in verse 14, which I, I read once again to you, it says, but small is the gate and narrow the road. So those leading to life. See, the gate leading to life, nice little narrow gate. The road is narrow. And why is that? It says right here. For few, only few find it. See, and that's such a shame. Only a few find it. See, so a lot of people have a problem with the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And this is what, what the Hebrew writers was trying to tackle here in the book of Hebrews. He was really trying to, and that's why he went to those first four verses of chapter one, trying to convince these Hebrews of the superiority of Jesus Christ. See, what had happened here, many of the Jews had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They witnessed his signs, his miracles, and the wonders that he did when, when he during his ministry here, three and a half year ministry. They witnessed all that. They saw him raise people from the dead. They saw him cure lepers. They saw him cure every form of disease that came before him. He cured them all. They saw him feed thousands of people from a few fishes and, and, and a few pieces of bread. They saw all that. And see, and then they became believers. They accepted him as their Lord and Savior. But see, then after his death, then spiritual warfare increased. See, so after his death, persecution increased greatly and peer pressure on the Jews. So after his death, many Jews now were stepping back into Judaism, see. And so the Hebrew writer here was trying to convince him, no, you're making a huge mistake. You don't want to do that. Okay. 
It's just like what Peter said in 2 Peter 2.22. He says that's the same, the proverb is true, a dog returns to a vomit. You know, why would a dog do that? He rejected the dog, vomited it out. Why would you return to that? It says, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's like a saw that has washed and returned to the wallowing in the mud. It's like you cleaned up this, this, this pig. They call it a what a saw. I guess it's the same thing. <laughs> and then it goes back to the mud. So the Hebrew writer's trying to say, why would you want to do that? Why wouldn't you go, want to go back into something that cannot save you? Why wouldn't you, do you want to go back and become filthy again in sin. And this is what he's trying to bring to their attention here. So in chapter 7, the writer of Hebrews, he, he's trying to use a different approach to prove to them of the superiority of Jesus Christ. But he's going to use the approach this time, he's going to bring in this, this mysterious person called Melchizedek that he's going to bring him in. See, what he's going to do, Melchizedek is mentioned in their book, a Torah. The Torah is the same as the Pentateuch. It's exactly the same thing, two different names. The first five books of the Bible. So he's going to use their own Torah, really the book of Genesis, the statement in there, which, which is the Torah, to prove to them that Jesus is superior. He's superior to the Torah, the Pentateuch. He's superior to the Talmud, which is the, all their laws and their customs and things is called the Talmud. He's going to prove them that he's superior to the Levitical priesthood, where the high priest had to make, really, atonement for his own sins and then the people. So he's going to prove to him that Jesus is superior to their own high priest. He's going to prove to them that Jesus is superior not only to Moses, but he's superior to Abraham. So he's going to do this, but he's going to use their own laws their own custom to prove it to them because they believed in their own laws, see. They believed in the Pentateuch, so he said, he's thinking, well, if I can use that to prove to them, and they don't see how they're making a huge mistake by stepping back into Judaism. See, maybe you know some people like that, have known some people like that. They were on fire for the Lord at one time, on fire for Jesus. Involved in Bible studies. Wouldn't miss a Sunday at church. They're every Sunday. See, but as the years go on, one, two years go on, less and less frequent. You start, they start missing church. Maybe once a month. Then twice a month. Then they're only going to church maybe once a month. But then you don't see them at all at church any longer, see. They're slowly stepping back in that from which they came but it's so slight they don't even notice it, see. They were once on fire for the Lord, but now they're lukewarm. You know what Revelations, Jesus said in Revelation about those who are lukewarm? He says, I spit you out of my mouth. In other words, you've been rejected. And that's why Matthew 7, 14 says, very few people go through that narrow door. We don't need a big wide door, the road is narrow. Very few people really want to dedicate their lives to serving God. Very few people want to put Jesus first in their life. He's second, third, fourth down on their list of priorities. So let's get into chapter 7. And then, if my glasses don't fall apart on me here, don't laugh. One day you'll have to wear glasses too. <laughs> Whoops. It just fell out. So let me try to read without my glasses here. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires that the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people. 
that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descendants from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by the people who die, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from the tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. In regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now this is a lot to take in. <laughs> It's a, it's a lot here, so I praise God that I, hopefully I'll be able to put it in a way to you that's easier to understand because there's really a lot said here. But the writer here of Hebrew brings up Melchizedek, that mysterious person that's mentioned in their book of Torah that they never really paid much attention to. Not at all. So he's trying to get them to realize this interaction that took place between Melchizedek and Abraham. But first, let me give you a background on these first three verses here of chapter 7, where Melchizedek meets Abraham. You remember, in the book of Genesis, God had Abraham pack up his household, all his herds, and his servants, and Abraham took Lot with him and moved to another land. Actually, they moved to Canaan. And after a few years, Lot's, uh, Abraham's household grew with servants, uh, with cattle, with sheep, and the same with Lot. His household grew with servant and sheep, so there really wasn't a, enough grazed land or room for both of them. So Abraham calls Lot together. And, and Abraham says, look, it's time that we go our separate ways. So Abraham, being the person that he is, said, look, Lot, if you choose, you can have any of the land you want. You choose whatever land you want. If you choose to go right, he says, I'll go left. He says, if you choose to go left, he says, then I will go right. So Abraham gave Lot first choice. So the Bible tells us that Lot chose the, the land of Jordan, the Valley of Jordan down there. And the Bible actually says this land there was reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. It was real fertile, beautiful land. Knowing Lot, Lot took that. It was right down there by Sodom and Gomorrah. So Abraham took what was left. And then a couple years later, this messenger appears at Lot's, uh, Abraham's tent. And it tells him that these four kings from the east and, and invaded these five kings from the west. See, Sodom and Gomorrah, those two, all, all cities had their own king. And there was five cities there and five kings. Sodom had his king, Gomorrah had his king, and three other, they had a king. So these kings from the east invaded these five kings from the west. And these kings from the east, they took as captive, as slaves, all the people from Sodom and Gomorrah, and that included his nephew Lot. And so when Abraham heard about this, the Bible says he got his 318 men together, and he tracked down this, these five kings, the leader of that king, and during the night, he, he attacked this king, he rescued all the people from Sodom and Gomorrah, and he took all the bounty these kings had taken from these five cities, and on the way back, 
it tells us here that he met Melchizedek. Now in Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 20, it talks about right after this battle where It says, after Abraham returned from defeating Kedorlaomer and the, the king's ally with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is, the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heavens and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. So this is what chapter 3 here, uh, 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 chapter 7, verses 1 through 3 is talking about, where Melchizedek came out and met Abraham. So the writer brings this out to the Hebrews' attention because he's trying to get them to see that this mysterious person, Melchizedek, he was the high priest. And he's trying to get the attention that why would Abraham give a tenth of everything he had to this high priest? Because their law doesn't require that at all. So, first of all, what is Melchizedek? What does the name mean, Melchizedek? Well, we know the name means a king of righteousness, point number one, and king of Salem means king of peace. <clears throat> so we can see here that Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. See, it, 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 he's a foreshadow of Jesus to come. So now, we know this by Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, tells us that <clears throat> in, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son today, I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. See, so this is a connection here that this writer is trying to prove to them that Melchizedek is typifying Jesus. He's a type of Jesus to come. A, a totally new priesthood. And this is what he's trying to explain to them. Now, let's go and read uh, chapter 7, verses 4 through 6. It says, Just think how great he was, even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now, the law requires that the descendants of Levi, who, who became priests, to collect a tenth from the people. See, the law says that only the priests could collect a tenth from the people. And the law says that you had to be able to prove that you are from the tribe of Levi by the birth of your father and mother. And so the writers here are trying to bring out that why would Abraham give Melchizedek a tenth of everything? His descendants can't be traced back to Levi. He's not from the Levitical priesthood. Why does Abraham consider him superior to that? And this is what the writer's getting into. So if we continue on, it says that is from the fellow Israelites, even though they also descended from Abraham. And verse 6, this man, however, did not trace his descendant from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had to promise him. So he's saying, this man didn't, couldn't trace his priesthood back to Levi. So why would Abraham do this? Was Abraham breaking their own laws of the Torah? See, so he's building the case to see how Melchizedek is superior to their high priest. He's superior to all the sacrificial law. He's trying to show them Melchizedek is superior to, to their Torah, to Moses, to Abraham, superior to all of that. And Melchizedek was typifying Jesus. And this is what he's trying to get them to understand. So we see as point two, there is no record at all of Melchizedek's ancestry. No beginning, no end of his ancestry here, okay? And so we, we go in here, verse seven through 10. It says, and without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. And in one case, the tenth is collected by the people who die. So he's saying in one case, those who collected the tenth are regular people and, and they die, okay? But it says that that's collected by the people who die, but in another case, by him who is declared to be living. And he's talking about Melchizedek, because there's no record of him ever being born, there's no record of him ever dying. 
because he is going to be a priest forever, typifying Jesus. So he's saying in one case, really, it's collected by someone who's never going to die. And so this is the case he's trying to prove. That. And then verse 9, it says, One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham. So he's saying, look, even though Levi hadn't been born yet, he was an ancestor of Abraham. He said, really, in a sense, you could say the Levitical priests who were collecting 10% from the Israelites, from the people, actually were giving it to Melchizedek because Abraham gave it to Melchizedek and they were his descendants. So he's trying to show them how Melchizedek is superior to the Levitical priesthood. But he's also trying to show them that the Levitical priesthood has to be replaced. And why does it have to be replaced? See, verse 11, the perfection that could have been attained, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek and not in the order of Aaron? So he's trying to show them if perfection could have been attained through their Levitical priesthood, through their high priest, there would not have been need for another. He's trying to get to understand that the Le Levitical priesthood didn't have any requirements whatsoever other than you had to prove that you were a Levi. There are no moral requirements. There are no spiritual requirements. We know God struck Aaron's two sons down because of things that they were doing in the altar. God disapproved of. The sons of Levi, God disapproved of. There were no standards there. No requirements other than you had to been born a Levi. So he's trying to say here, if perfection could have been obtained through your high priest, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, there would not have been need for another priest to come. But those priests always die one after another. Those priests were sacrificing animals for the atonement of the sins, and animals' blood cannot pay for the sins of human beings, of those created in God's image. Only Jesus' blood can do that. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this is what he's trying to prove to them. So he's saying there, there is a need for another priesthood. But this priesthood is going to have different requirements. And if we go, if we continue reading here in, in, in verse 12 to 14, it, it says, For when the priesthood is changed, see, and it's going to be changed from the Levitical priesthood, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe. See? And they're being said about Melchizedek or are, are Jesus, totally different tribe, not from the tribe of Levi. No one from that tribe has ever served at the altar, for it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and it is regarded to that the, the tribe Moses said nothing about priests from the tribe of Judah. So he's saying, if the priesthood has changed, the law has been changed. No more is the requirement that you had to have been born from the tribe of Levi. No longer a requirement. Because the Levitical, the Levitical priesthood could not bring about perfection. There are some people today that look for other roads that will lead them to perfection. Some people think that meditation, certain Eastern religions, that if they practice this, if they do that, will lead them to perfection. See, and they were thinking that the Levitical priesthood we lead them for perfection. The rest said, no, he can't do that. The blood of animals cannot do that. But the people today, some people today think that by works they can gain perfection. They can go to heaven. Meditation, all kind of different methods. But Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except to me, Jesus said. There is no other way to gain perfection. So he's trying to get the, the Hebrews to realize that there is no other way to gain perfection. You don't go back to Judaism to a, a method that cannot bring about perfection. 
No, you stay with Jesus Christ. The same with the, there's no other way for any of us here today to gain perfection other than through Jesus Christ. He is that narrow door. That's that narrow road to get to heaven and get to the Father. It's Jesus Christ. And this is what he's trying to prove here. So now there's different requirements here. The requirements here, we go on to, on to read in verse 15, and we have said, and even more clear, if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of regulation as to ancestry, but on the basis of the power of indestructible life. So he's saying here, the law has been changed now. Be a high priest now. The qualification has to be that you have indestructible life on the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek had no beginning, no end. Okay? His priesthood was never superseded. It's not based on ancestry at all. So we know that point number five, Jesus has become a priest in the order of Melchizedek on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. We have a high priest up there that will never die. He has no beginning and end. A high priest there who's always there to atone for our sin forever and ever. And that's something the Levitical priesthood could not do. So the writer here, you can see a Hebrew, is trying to get them to understand this Melchizedek that's mentioned in your own book of Torah was actually referring to Jesus Christ, a totally different priesthood that they once accepted and now they are stepping back into Judaism and he's trying to get them to realize the horrible mistake that they were making. We had that same burden on us to get people to realize who are now stepping back into the world, who once tasted the goodness of Christ and the Holy Spirit. As A.J. brought out that last Sunday, they tasted that goodness and then they want to step back into the world. See, we have to pray for these people. We have to use our best argument, as the argument he's trying to use here with, with the Hebrews, using an argument, using their own commands and laws to prove to them that Jesus is superior. And we must do the same thing to people we know that are stepping back into the world. You don't want to go there. You don't want to do that. There's only one way to reach this perfection, only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You can't get there by medication. You can't get there by works or yoga or whatever the East religion. You can't get there that way, and we must convince these people that. There's not many paths to God or many paths past the heaven as many people want to believe to justify the way that they're living their life. We have to say, no, there is only one narrow gate, one narrow road. Now, how does Jesus meet our needs here today? And it's really explained to us, and we finish this off in verses 23 to 28, how Jesus meets our needs as our high priest. And verse 23, it says, now there have been many of those priests and they're talking about Levitical priesthood. Since death prevented them from coming in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. There he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for us. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalt above the heavens, Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weaknesses, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. The oath that they're referring to here is the oath that Jesus made in Psalms 110.4. If they can go to that, uh, Psalms 110 verse 4. If not, it's an oath that God made about his son. 110.4. The Lord... And it's capital letters. When you say capital letters like that, it means it's talking about Jehovah God. It's talking about God the Father. It's saying, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. It's referring to Jesus Christ. He will be our high priest forever. The Lord has sworn that and he has given us that oath. Amen? Amen. Amen.